often interested in distributions that have some kind of localization to them. So for example, I've drawn a possible distribution of some quantity uh, x here. And we can see that the most probable value of x, or x is kind of centered here. And our knowledge about x is kind of this wide. And we can also see further properties, such as it looks like the probability of x falls off more rapidly here on the right than it does on the left here. Well, what we'd like to be able to do is summarize these impressions of the shape of the probability of x in terms of a small number of numbers. We've already seen distributions that do have this somewhat localized property. We saw beta distributions when we did Bernoulli trials, and we saw these distributions that don't really have any simple functional form. They were the product of lots of binomial terms when we looked at the example of the town family. So suppose we want to summarize p of x, this curve, by a single number a and call it its value. In fact, we're going to call it its mean value in this first example. So let's find a value a, a number, that would be somewhere along this x-axis that minimizes the mean square discrepancy of the typical value of x. Now let's think about what that means. Suppose a were here. Well, then there would be a lot of values of x out here that differ from a. And we're going to essentially total up what the square of their distance is from a. Why the square? Because we want negative distances from a to also count as positive. In other words, when we square them, values. We're going to use expectation notation a lot in this. So let's recall that the notation is when we put anything inside angle brackets, what we mean by that is we take anything and we take its weighted average over all possible values of x, weighting by the probability distribution of x. Now since this is a an integral which is linear, you can easily see, and I hope you already know, that the expectation of anything is linear over sums of any things, constant times anything. In other words, we can move angle brackets around to take advantage of this linearity. So let's do our little exercise here and minimize just this quantity we'll call it delta squared. The definition of that will be the expectation of the distance of x from some value a squared. And we're going to minimize this with respect to a so that a becomes this characteristic description of the probability distribution. Now, you square this thing out, and you get this. And then I'm going to leave it to you as a little exercise. Please go off and do this. It takes about one line to get from this to this using those linearity properties of expectation brackets. Another trick, I had to add and subtract the expectation of x squared here to get it into this form. But just to get you started, I can, on this first term, take the expectation, and since it's linear over sums, bring this left bracket in on this term to get an expectation of x squared. And then you have to figure out what to do where the expectation brackets end up on this term and on this term. Anyway, the result you can see is an expression that has a piece that doesn't depend on a at all, so that won't enter into the minimization. And then this piece, which we can trivially figure out what the minimum is. The trivial minimum of this is 0, and it achieves that only if we set a equal to the expectation of x. Well, it sounds a little circular, but actually it's not. We've actually learned something. We've learned that the expectation of x, which is also called the mean of x, has the property that it is the value that minimizes the mean square deviation of the probabilistic values of x around it. 
we could have done that calculation not just by inspection. We could have done it the long way, taking the derivative of this expression with respect to a and setting it to zero, if you like mechanical calculations. So we've ignored this piece because this piece doesn't depend on a, but if you stare at that, we shouldn't be ignoring it. That's the variance. And we see that the mean square deviation of any quantity around any point a is the square difference from of the expectation from a plus the variance of the quantity. This in physics is sometimes called the parallel axis theorem. I bet it has a name in statistics, but I don't know what the name of it is. Why do we use the mean square? That might have seemed somewhat arbitrary to you. Why didn't we use, for example, mean absolute? So let's try that. Let's define a new delta, which is the expectation of the absolute value of x minus a for some unknown value a that we're going to solve for. Um, now, how do you take an expectation of an absolute value? Expectation is always the same. It's just the integral weighted by p of x dx of what the anything is, the x minus a. Now, to do this integral, we have to be a little tricky because this is non-analytic at x equals a. So we break it up into two pieces. When x is less than a, then the absolute value is a minus x. And we do that integral just from minus infinity. x goes from minus infinity to a. And then when x is greater than a, so we do the integral from a to infinity, the integrand becomes x minus a. We want to take the derivative of this quantity delta and set it equal to 0 with respect to a. Take the derivative. So what's the derivative of this guy with respect to a? This takes us all the way back to elementary calculus. Remember, if you have the quantity a appearing in both the limit and in the integrand, then you, when you take the derivative, you're going to get two terms. You're going to get the integral of the derivative of the integrand. So the derivative of this thing with respect to a is just the p of x dx. And then you're also going to get a term which is from the little change in a at the limit, and that would be the value of the integrand at a. Oh, that's easy. The value is 0, so we get to put 0 there. Similarly, we can do this integral and get the, um, I should say, take the derivative of this, and we get the derivative of the integrand, which is now minus p of x plus the extra piece for taking the derivative at the limit, which is, again, 0. So our equation says that 0 equals this minus this, or this equals this. And notice that together they have to make up a value 1 because it's the integral of a probability distribution. So each of them has to be a half. Aha, uh -huh. that should look familiar. a is the median value. That's the value that has an equal area under the curve to the left of a as to the right of a. So what we've learned is that mean and median are both completely principled ways of defining a measure of central tens tendency. Mean is the way of defining it that minimizes the least square deviation, and median is the way of describing it that minimizes, I should say, of defining it that minimizes the mean absolute deviation. The mean was the first moment where we put i equal 1 here. But there also is notation and names for higher moments. So in general, the ith moment of a distribution p of x will be the integral of x to the ith power p of x dx. It's also useful to define what are called centered moments. The centered ith moment, which is often denoted m sub i, says that you take x you subtract its mean, and then you take the expectation value of the ith power of it. So similarly, that's the integral of x minus the mean of x to the i times p of x dx. Among these centered moments, the second centered moment, m2, is by far the most useful. That is, of course, the variance. 
we can see that m2, which is defined as the variance of x, is in its definition as a moment the expectation of x minus the expectation of x squared and of the first expectation. And if you square this out and figure out where you can move the expectation bars in on each expression, you'll get that it's the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x squared. By the way, in the moving of expectation brackets around, you can keep in mind that the expectation of any constant is that constant. And similarly, the expectation of any expectation is just that expectation, because it, an expectation is a constant. It no longer depends on x. The square root of the variance is often defined as the standard deviation, often written sigma of x. And that summarizes in the same units of x what is the rough half width, or um, RMS, root mean square deviation from the mean of the distribution. Half width means from the center to the side. Full width means from the left side to the right side in terms of how the language is used. The third and fourth moments, where we would put a 3 or a 4 in these exponents, also have names. Something related to the third moment is called the skewness. And that can measure whether a distribution extends more to the right than to the left. That would be called positive skewness. Or the other way around is negative skewness. And the fourth moment measures something like does the distribution look more like a bread loaf? That would be a negative kurtosis. And that has this fun name, platykurtic. Or if it looks more like a witch's hat, that's a positive kurtosis. And that's called leptokurtic. Nobody really uses those words, but you can impress your friends with them. The reason people don't use those words in modern day statistics is that higher moments are a bit of a trap. There are perfectly good distributions that occur in real life that don't have higher moments. The higher moments are divergent. We'll learn about that later. There's just nothing wrong with that in the distribution. It's just that you can't describe it by a moments. And a closely related fact to that is it can take a lot of data to measure high moments accurately. And there are just better ways of doing things that don't require that you measure those moments. I'm sure you all know, and you are now in a position to trivially work out, that the mean of the sum is equal to the sum of the means. I'm using some notation here that's often used in physics or the natural sciences, using a bar, meaning exactly the same thing as expectation brackets. And you've also probably learned that if x and y are independent quantities, independent random variables, the variance of x plus y is the variance of x plus the variance of y. You might wonder whether this extends to higher moments. If I take the third moment or the third centered moment, is it also additive? That on the sum is equal to the sum of the that's? Oh, look, a typo. That should be a y. The answer is that the moments are not additive. But there are certain combinations of them that are called semi-invariants or cumulants that are additive. So the second semi-invariant is the second centered moment. The third semi-invariant is the third centered moment. So that one turns out, yes, it is additive. The fourth one, however, you see, is not just the fourth moment. It's this combination of the fourth and the second. And after that, they just get more and more complicated. If you wanted, I don't think you should do this, but if you wanted an additive sixth moment, you would form this combination of the sixth moment, the second moment, the fourth moment, the third moment, the second moment, etc. It's kind of fun how these are derived. If you know a little bit about probability, uh, you'll also learn a little bit more in this course. But if you want now to see a derivation of these funny combinations of moments, you can look at Wikipedia under cumulant. It's actually pretty cool. 
Skew and kurtosis, I told you those names on the previous slides, are actually not defined as the bare third semi-invariant and fourth semi-invariant. They're actually defined as these combinations, I3 divided by I2 to the 3 halves. What's going on here? The idea is to make this dimensionless, to make this a property only of the shape of the curve and not of the scale of the curve. And similarly for kurtosis, if you divide I4 by I2 squared, you get a property that bread loaf versus witch's hat property, which doesn't depend on the scale, either horizontal or, or vertical of the curve, but only on the shape of it. So here's a factoid to end with. A Gaussian, that is to say a normal distribution, we're going to learn a lot more about that later, a normal distribution has all of its semi-invariance higher than I2 equal to zero. So in a certain sense, the Gaussian viewed by moments is the simplest possible distribution. It has all zero moments, or rather semi-invariance, except for the low ones that you need to define where it is and how wide it is. And it turns out, another factoid, a Poisson distribution, we'll learn about later, has all of its semi-invariance equal to its mean. And that's all we really need to know for now about moments.